Hello, my name is Justin Woodland. Um, I've been at Clearwater about four years, and over about the last year or so, I've been uh, working on creating uh, automated regression te testing tools using Docker um, for some of the very intense data intensive portions of our technology stack. Um, so using Docker has allowed us to very easily compare two builds of a project um, and uh, easily observe any differences in the data generated from them. Um, while containers can be useful in many types of testing, uh, today we really only have enough time to talk about uh, regression testing. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and jump in. So before we talk about containers, uh, we're gonna discuss some of the difficulties uh, that we have in, in regression testing. Uh, then we're gonna take a, a quick look uh, at containers to get a, gain a basic understanding of what they are and why they can be an effective testing tool. Uh, and then we'll be building a very simple regression testing framework using containers. Um, and then finally, we'll analyze uh, some of the pros and cons of, of regression testing in containers and see if it might be a good fit for your project. Okay, so regression testing can be pretty difficult. Um, while I, this isn't an, an, a, this isn't an exhaustive list of everything that I've seen, um, reasons why uh, regression testing is hard, but these are some of the most prevalent ones that I've come across over and over. Uh, so isolating data changes is is different or is difficult. Uh, so specifically dealing with database state, uh, if we use multiple environments for our regression tests. It, it makes it difficult to make sure that the database's initial state is clean, or at least the same at the beginning, um, or even really that the initial st uh, schema of the database is, is, this, is consistent across both sides. Uh, this reduces our confidence level in the results that we get from our regression tests. Uh, the same goes for configuration. Uh, if we have two environments that are configured with a, a tool like, say, Puppet, there's, there's a chance that the configuration may be different from one side to the other, um, and this could uh, impact our regression results. So this also reduces our, our confidence in the regression results. Um, uh, when we run regression tests, we really need to ensure that they run as close to parallel as possible. Uh, if they run serially, there's a chance that uh, an outside service that we depend on uh, may have changed, so the data that it's serving up may be different from one run to the next. Um, or it could be a completely different version if the, the run time is long enough. Uh, somebody may have redeployed that uh, service that we depend on, and now we're looking at uh, not the differences in our product or our project, but someone else's project. Lastly, uh, if we run two tests in the same environment using the same database, the tests overwrite each other, and our, our regression results, results are, are pretty much useless at that point. Okay, so now we can talk about containers just a little bit. Uh, in order to gain a, a working understanding of, of what containers are, we're gonna look at the current most prevalent um, platform, containerization platform which is Docker. Uh, containerization and Docker are pretty much used uh, synonymously uh, today. So there are other solutions that exist, uh, such as Rocket or LXD or Apache Mesos, uh, but we'll really only touch on some of the Docker-specific terminology. So these are some of the, the terms that you might encounter in your first 10 minutes of, of Googling Docker. So an, an image, um, so it's a file that contains everything required for execution. It can be shipped or stored, just like any other executable, like a jar. Um, the only difference being that no other dependencies are required. It can be started on any machine that has Docker installed on it without any additional work. So the, the, the state of the image is static um, and immutable. It won't change over time. When we execute an image uh, using Docker, we get a container. Uh, so it can, a container can't be shipped or stored because it contains a running process. 
um, and containers can be stopped or restarted and the internal state um, can change over time. Uh, when a container is running, it needs a place to uh, communicate with other containers. So Docker creates an isolated network uh, to interact with, uh, to allow containers to interact with each other. Uh, a new container must be uh, expressly granted permission to join a network. Um, and networks can be created or, or destroyed using a simple Docker command. Uh, a registry is uh, a storage place for uh, Docker images. Uh, so if we don't have an image locally that we need to run, uh, Docker will pull it from a registry. And uh, the default uh, Docker registry is Docker Hub, uh, but others are also provided by Google or Amazon, or you can host your own registry as well. And the repository and tag, um, that's just a, a simple way to uniquely identify a specific image stored in a, in a registry. So now that we've got some of that uh, basic terminology out of the way, let's take a, a closer look at what makes containers powerful. So here's a, a quick, uh, simple Docker command. Um, by using the, the run command, which you can see here in just a moment, um, we're asking Docker to do several things. Uh, first thing it does is it, fetch, it, it fetches an image from the Docker Hub registry using the, the name of the repository that we uh, specified. It then creates a new image or a new container from that image and executes the code that's contained in that image. And when the code, code has exited, uh, then the container quits. Uh, the life cycle of the container is only as long as the process uh, contained in it. So if we were to run this command again, uh, a new instance of that uh, uh, that uh, image would be spun up into a new container. Um, so the, the container has a new name, uh, a new file system, um, and the exact same initial state as the first execution. So this highlights a couple of important properties of, of Docker containers and images that we'll discuss. Um, so containers whoops, are isolated. Uh, containers isolate software from its host and from any outside resources. Um, this isolation is especially uh, important in the context of regression testing because it allows us to have reasonable guarantees that our application isn't doing anything, isn't accessing anything that we haven't explicitly given it uh, permission to. So Docker contained uh, processes don't have access to the host's file system uh, or the network stack on the host either. So images are immutable. This means that uh, when you run an image, it behaves the same on a developer's box or in a staging environment or in the production environment. Um, it, 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 and it acts that way because all of that, uh, everything is prepackaged, all of the system libraries, all of the, uh, uh, all of the code, all of the settings are prepackaged into a Docker image. Um, this, this also makes it really easy to make uh, clusters of, of machines so, or of Docker uh, containers because we uh, are guaranteed to have the same initial state um, at the beginning of the, the run. Uh, so images are executable. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, image contains everything that you need to have it run, the code, the runtime, uh, any system tools. Um, and it, that's really nice because it abstracts the interface for running a program. Uh, so the, you could have version one of a project written in uh, PHP and um, stick that into a, a Docker image and um, then write version two in Java. And the, the interface that uh, the user um, uh, interacts with is, hasn't changed. You still just run Docker, um, Docker run and the name of the image, and it will run, or it should run, the same. Um, so normally, this might uh, introduce a lot of like DevOps overhead, uh, provisioning new server servers, or um, configuring servers to run um, a different, uh, completely different language with a different runtime. Uh, so images are extendable. 
Uh, so we can extend a Docker image using a Docker file. Uh, and this basically ensures that two images uh, created from a, a, a single uh, base image uh, were identical up until that point. Um, so because they're extendable, it, it really allows us to uh, just test our application and not really test the, uh, the operating system. So we can, uh, we can take the same base image and put our application into both, or in, put, our, put two versions of our application into two um, extensions of that base image. And the only thing that's different between them is our application. Okay, so here's a, a, a quick uh, example of how to dockerize an application. Uh, so the, the from instruction, uh, it specifies a base image and, and lets us reuse a common set of, of system tools. So for example, if, if we need to start off with the Ubuntu base image because that has something in it that we need, then we don't have to worry about having anything else installed. Uh, so the, the copy instruction uh, lets us copy uh, a directory from our local machine into the Docker image. Um, the run instruction um, allows us to modify the state of the, uh, the image. So for example, we can run uh, Maven clean install or we can run um, app get update and app get install Java. Um, and those, those changes that have been made to that image um, will be uh, persisted when we build that image. So um, we have a, a very short list of the changes that were made to that. Uh, image in order to get it into the state that we need it. And then the entry point down here at the bottom, uh, that specifies uh, the, the place that we want our image to start when we run it. When it becomes a container, this is the, the command that will be executed. And this is just a bit of a side note. Um, so Docker Compose, it's a, a tool for defining like multi-application multi Docker or multi-container Docker applications. Um, and I'll be using this in, in a couple of the examples. Um, so it's not included with Docker, but uh, it's a pretty easy tool to understand. Um, there's just a configuration file that um, helps you bundle multiple applications together and uh, define some interactions between them. Okay, so with all of that that we've just talked about, let's go ahead and make a a very lightweight uh, regression testing framework. I'm gonna have to look over to the side here because it got a got my terminal. So hopefully this doesn't blow up in my face. Okay. Actually, before we do that, let's look at some of the some of the things that we need in order to create it. So uh, first thing that we need is a project under test. Um, so for this example, I've uh, got a two container um, application. Uh, so it requires a database, uh, which I've chosen to just use Mongo database because it's quite easy. Um, and then a program. Uh, for this example, I've written a very simple program that goes out to the XKCD website, uh, downloads some information about each of the comics, and, um, and then writes that information to the database. Uh, then we also need a, a, data, uh, a way to extract the data differences. And this is probably uh, the more difficult portion. Uh, so we need a, data, a database spe specific implementation of how to compare two databases. So for example, with MS SQL Server, you would need to write uh, a short application that knew how to compare um, the schema and the data in a SQL database. Um, with Mongo, it's pretty easy. We just point it at the two databases and uh, it will iterate through the collections and um, compare everything in them. Uh, and then we need a way to compare the differences. Um, so any tool that knows how to diff will work, um, such as diff or meld or kdiff. Um, and then we need a way to uh, uh, compose our test com components in a consistent way, and Docker Compose allows us to do that. 
So uh, this is the, the Docker compose file that we're going to be using, um, just to kind of highlight some, some areas. Uh, so uh, in a Docker compose file, we have a list of services. So we have a Mongo database service, an XKCD1 service um, that builds uh, using the XKCD1 directory in my, on my machine. Um, and then XKCD2, so that's version two of it, and I've got that in a separate directory. And then uh, we have a, this container that knows how to diff Mongo databases. And then down here at the bottom, you can see that we're uh, attaching my, uh, a directory in my home directory to the slash temp slash results directory in this diff container so that I can uh, access those differences. Okay, so this is the, uh, a, a small code snippet from the difference finder. Uh, so we're, we're taking, uh, we, we have a list of, of differences and then you can see we're um, iterating through the collection names and then selecting um, or fetching the results from each side. Uh, so from database one and database two, and then calculating the set difference. So this is written in TypeScript, so there's no set dot difference, regrettably, but it's, this is taking the set difference of the left and the right sides. Um, and then we uh, package those up into an object uh, with the name of the, the uh, Mongo collection, and then uh, we, uh, write those to the system, or write those to, to the files. Whoops. Okay, and then this is uh, just a very uh, small view of the uh, directory structure of uh, the project under test. It's literally just a DAO that talks to the Mongo database, uh, uh, a main file that has uh, some logic to, to loop through uh, some numbers and write to the database. And then we've got this uh, data class, the XKCD metadata um, class. And that, that just has a few fields in it. There's no uh, methods in it. So we can see here, the, and this, all of this right here is, uh, has been, um, that's directly from the XKCD API. Um, and then you can see down at the bottom um, this is a line that I've added in um, XKCD version two, and um, we'll see that here in, in this, this next, next example. Um, we are just setting that to the current time. Um, so this line was also added in XKCD two. So what do we expect to happen? We expect to run both sides, and on one side, we expect to, to see uh, n number of fields, and on the other side, we expect to see n plus one number of fields. So let's go ahead and run that regression test. So um, just a, a quick explanation of what we're going to do here. So uh, Docker Compose has uh, a couple of commands. Uh, the first one that we're going to be running is Docker Compose down and the dash V gets rid of any volumes that Docker has created. This ensures that we have a, a clean initial state. Um, and then uh, Docker compose build, that ensures that um, both sides were built correctly, that they have the, the most current changes. And Docker compose up uh, brings up the, the entire application, um, all of the containers in it. So we'll go ahead and run that and you can see what happens. So you can see now it's building the application or, or all of the containers in the application. Now it's run them. So MongoDB, these are just the logs from the Mongo database. And you can see that we've started inserting comic records um, in XKCD1 and XKCD2. So now that that's finished, we should be able to um, pull those up in a diff uh, program of some kind and uh, view the results. And we, our hypothesis was correct on 
the left side we've got n, and on the right side if we've, we've got n plus one. So. If I can find my mouse here. Okay, so here's another quick example. Um, so on the top is the first side. So we've got uh, a loop that goes from start number to end number um, with a, a less than symbol. And then on the bottom, we've added any equal sign. So very common programmer error, we get off by one. So we're gonna uh, go ahead and find another regression uh, the same way that we did before. So we do need to change our, our file uh, just very slightly so to look at version three. And then we're gonna run the same Docker Compose down, Docker Compose build, and Docker Compose up. And then when that is finished running, we should have uh, once again, our, our left and right sides that should um, show that we have one extra record on the right side, whereas that's, that record is missing on the left side. So, and it, it really is just that simple. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot to it. Um, granted, this is a very small example, a very uh, toy example. Um, but we've found that if, if we can uh, use uh, two versions of a, of a program that are very close to each other, um, so uh, they're not, uh, you know, 100 revisions away from each other, it, it allows us to very accurately find um, differences between the programs. Whether those be ex uh, expected regressions or not, that's, that's really up to a human to, to decide. Um, but uh, we, we provide that tool um, to our, our users to, to find the data regressions. Okay. So I've uh, posted the, the sources for that to my GitHub account. Um, if you'd like to, you can go download those and play around with them. Uh, there's, there's really not a whole lot there um, as far as complexity, but it, it is a, a complete working example. So um, just a, a, a brief uh, aside. So the, we, we've uh, created a, a tool here at Clearwater um, called the Regressor um, that uh, uses Docker in much the same way as, as we've described here. Um, but uh, it allows us to parameterize our, our tests much more easily. Uh, so it, it, uh, it helps us build up uh, Docker Compose files and then it will run them so that uh, we have a, a templating system where someone can create a, a template that's very similar to a Docker Compose file. Um, and then parameterize certain parts of it so that it can be run uh, with many different applications. Um, and we've seen uh, a, a lot of benefit to that. Uh, the, one of our, the teams on our, in, in Clearwater has uh, started using that as part of their, their daily uh, process. And there are even some uh, clients that we uh, have uh, been uh, had an opportunity to exercise this uh, code with um, and uh, to, to really great effect. So, um, and then just a quick analysis. Uh, this is very biased because um, I have been using it for quite a while um, and um, nobody likes to decide that something that they've been using for a long time has little value. <laughs> so um, just take it with a grain of salt. Um, that it is biased. So I, it's, it's very fast to iterate with. Um, so it's very easy to uh, uh, create a, a, a Docker Compose file and then mutate it in ways that uh, you hadn't thought of before, um, which allows you to uh, 
regression tests not only your application, but um, we've, we've also used it to, um, when we bump our dependencies, uh, we, we can run the application, um, the, uh, you know, version one and, and version two, with the only change being that we've bumped, bumped our dependencies, and that'll, it should be that there are no regressions. And so uh, if there are regressions, that's a problem. Um, so isolation uh, is another benefit that I uh, have re recognized. Um, it's very easy to uh, uh, spin up an entire environment of applications um, and then have it be torn down at the end. Uh, you don't have to tie up your dev environment or a QA environment in order to run regression tests. Um, it, it allows um, a much higher bandwidth uh, of regression testing. Um, it's very repeatable. Um, the, uh, the configuration is pretty simple. So if, if you change something in the configuration, um, you should have, a, it should be pretty obvious uh, that a, a regression that you found is based on that uh, change. So it's also very generic. Uh, we could very easily have written an XKCD web service on top of our Mongo data, database and then written uh, a small application to um, find the differences between two web services. Um, so it's, it's very uh, composable in that way as well. Um, so, and I guess in, in summary, um, we, we know that regression testing is, can, can be difficult. Um, we, we have uh, an essential understanding of containers. Um, we've played around with, created a, a simple regression testing framework, and uh, we've analyzed some of the uh, pros and cons and come to the conclusion that it, it may be worth your time to, to investigate. So um, I know that our, uh, at Clearwater, the, the few teams that have tried uh, this method have found it to be successful, and I hope that you do too. Are there any questions? So the question was, uh, have I heard anything about building containers in dev build? Or building in containers in dev build? Or building containers in dev build? OK. Uh, well, the, the way that we've been doing it um, is there's a, a Maven plugin for the, the Java applications um, where that's exactly what we've been doing is um, we've been, uh, the, the Maven plugin uh, lets us point at a Docker file, and then it builds the, the application um, into a container, and then uh, stores that in our, in our artifact store. So um, you could also do it the other way around, um, where I, I think that Jenkins supports uh, spinning up containers as a build environment for an application, um, and then that, that uh, generated artifact non-Docker artifact is then pushed up to the artifact store. So either way works. How does resource sharing between Docker and like the host work? Like the Docker has free reign to all the host resources, but... So the question was, um, how does resource sharing work between the, the Docker host? Um, so Docker has uh, pretty it's pretty permissive, so there's, there's a lot that uh, Docker has access to. Um, so it does not have direct access by default to like the network stack. Um, so it, it can't uh, like, it can't intercept the network traffic, um, for example. Um, it does have direct access to the RAM and um, so the, the file system for each container is stored in a Docker specific directory. Um, so it technically has access to that portion of the, the, the disk, but it's, it's uh, cordoned off by Docker. So I don't know if that answered your question. I guess what about more like RAM? 
Yeah, so um, it, it does have free reign on CPU and RAM, but you can also specify this container should only use X percent of RAM or um, 10 megabytes of RAM. Um, and same thing with CPU. Have you used that feature for performance testing? Um, so have we used that feature for performance testing? The Kind of indirectly, so some of the applications that we've uh, used this with have, like they gather performance metrics while they're running um, and that saves it to the database and that allows us to very easily see, hey, this, this, this row in the like performance table was different um, and we can look and see, well, this one ran longer than that one. And you know, by default, there's, there's not a lot of that built in, um, but you could certainly instrument that in the application. Uh, uh, resources that I would recommend for tackling the learning curve. Uh, the, the Docker uh, documentation is, is really good. Um, and uh, so Docker Compose is, is also, um, it's, it's not included with Docker, but it is a Docker product or project. Um, so you could definitely, uh, I, I would highly recommend just perusing the, the Docker documentation. I think mo most anything you would want to know is there. Um, every once in a while, I have had to go to like the, the Docker GitHub page um, and like dig around in the like, issues to uh, explain something that I run into, but that, that has been uh, pretty rare. All right. Thank you for your time.